I'm Jeff Gritzner, 72 years old, and um, live near Florence and have been at the university for 23 years. I teach geography largely with an emphasis on cultural, historical, and environmental geography. Uh, on September 27th of 2001. A quick note about typefaces versus fonts. My name is Kevin McManigal. I'm 43 years old and I've lived in Missoula for five years. The horizontals are called crossbars. I'm a full-time lecturer for the University of Montana here in the geography department and I teach cartography and GIS. The terminal is the end. I'm under the impression after reading a lot of material, a lot of peer-reviewed journals, a lot of reports that um, uh, we uh, as uh, anthropogenic forces are causing some of the warming and some of the climate change that we've seen by our introduction of excess CO2 into the atmosphere. No, uh, the situation is far more serious really. We should really be focusing on revegetation, uh, should be uh, very much concerned about biological diversity. Humans have had a huge impact on climate change. The deforestation shifts the albedo, surface rubble activity, air mass behavior, a whole range of things. Dr. Gritzner sees the problem of CO2 being released in the atmosphere, but he doesn't see it as the biggest problem that we have. Carbon dioxide becomes an asset in large-scale environmental restoration because it's the building block of plants and, and so on. So it actually sort of consumes the CO2 issue while conferring this broad range of ecosystem services and other benefits. Dr. Gritzner and I have a great working relationship and we really like to banter ideas back and forth on things and what's great about Dr. Gritzner is his vast knowledge of the literature and you can ask him a question about almost any subject and he can point you to the books and the articles that you should read to learn more about it. I think that Kevin McManagill is, is just amazing. He's a very uh, hands-on, very well read, um, very thoughtful um, individual. I'll agree to have a conversation with him about anything. I mean, they're always uh, lively, they're always good. I always come away better informed than when I went into them, um, but also because he listens to my point of view. I, I must say that we, we haven't talked about um, global climate change in great depth. For me, looking at the, the climate issue and trying to do something about it, um, on a policy uh, to get the public behind some kind of a, a policy change requires uh, um, some kind of a definitive answer for them. The public wants a definitive answer always. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now we have, you know, many years since the Rio summit, uh, now through Copenhagen twice, um, and many reports from the ICCP looking at uh, both a, a temperature record that's coming from actual instruments in the last century and then the paleoclimatology, so this recreation of climate into the past um, using proxies from tree rings and from ice cores and from uh, the, you know, sediments in the, in the sea floor. Um, uh, the vast majority of scientists, certainly all the ones working for the IPCC, now have concluded that they believe that our output of CO2 from burning our fossil fuels um, is causing at least some of this climate change. Um, certainly the discussion has changed away from purely global warming because we are seeing cooling as you mentioned in some areas at the same time we're seeing rises in temperatures in others. Um, however, we've reached this point where it seems as though the CO2 is one of the main culprits. Do you think we've reached a point where we can say, okay, we, we are now at a, a point in the science that we really, really need to, to formulate some policy to try and do something about the amount of CO2 that's being pumped into the atmosphere. Much of that release is in deforestation. It's in soil erosion. We have about 20% of the CO2 uh, comes from forest burning, which is more than the CO2 released by all the cars, trucks, buses, trains, and so on in the world. Mm -hmm. There's a tremendous amount of carbon that's being through flooding and through soil erosion and so on, this entering the, the oceans causing both acidification and increasing the, the, uh, the carbon content of the conveyor. The planet is already dramatically transformed and, um, and the climate, the Earth system is composed of the, of the lithosphere and the atmosphere and the hydrosphere and the biosphere. They all are interactive. And so those changes have huge impacts with regard to climate. And that's seldom taken into consideration. I'd agree. I think we both would agree that, yeah, the ecosystems of the Earth have been dramatically changed. 
And I see your concern with how things, uh, especially the historical context, has been left out of the discussion and some of the technical aspects of, of climate change have been left out of the discussion. But I think the reason for that, and you can tell me whether you believe this to be true or not, is, is because um, we're, we're trying to educate uh, the, the general public on these issues, and sometimes it can be muddled with so much scientific uh, terminology and so forth. Um, not that it's not important or that the scientists shouldn't be looking at these things, but um, in order uh, for political policy to change, it needs to be clear and concise so that the public can digest it and make a decision on whether they want to support this political policy or not. Would you agree with that or do you see some changes? I, I think that it's important that the, um, that the policy be science-based. Agreed. There's this problem, a growing problem really in science of proving hypotheses instead of testing hypotheses. There also is a problem in sorting out levels of abstraction. CO2, and he, that's, that's really at the level of hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And much of the rest of, of what I was describing of historical environmental changes and structural changes within the Earth system, that's really at the level of theory. I mean, it's, it's much greater. And it seems to me that um, what, for example, if, if large-scale environmental restoration were chosen as what can be addressed, and it can be addressed far more easily mm -hmm. than sort of combating, stopping climate change, you know, or yeah. warming or whatever. Uh, but it, it also consumes the CO2 issue in large-scale restoration. And, um, and it solves so many more problems going beyond the practical and economic in, into the psychological and spiritual and, and so on. And, um, and there are a, a lot of reasons for paying more attention to that in terms of policy than to settle on a policy that's a little bit unclear and, and, uh, and poorly defined scientifically. Uh -huh. And uh, so I, I think that in, in, in many cases, um, it doesn't help to have this sort of uh, policy linked so directly to a, a fairly um, questionable hypothesis. I think that because it's so big and so many people are putting their opinions into it, that the, the, the consensus comes out of um, the, the, the sheer mass, the weight, and it might be political, um, but the, the political uh, ends that they're driving for require that they have a unified voice. Um, I understand that that can be a problem in science. You're not supposed to come up with the answer before you even do the test, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, without a unified voice, it doesn't seem that there can be any action taken. So if I were to take this to your scenario where maybe climate change isn't addressed by just looking at CO2, but is more addressed in a holistic picture of all the Earth's ecosystems, and we start looking at large-scale restoration, I think we would run into the same wall of getting any large-scale restoration projects funded and started and completed if there isn't a unified voice saying, yes, we do need to spend these billions or trillions of dollars on this. We've gotten into this um, mode of uh, sort of enemy orientation and environmental restoration on a large scale, you know, like the Macedonian project where they planted 7.5 million trees in a day. Uh, oh, wow. These kinds of things can be done relatively easily and nobody really objects. Nobody really cares I've about environmental heard, restoration. Yeah. Nobody has a problem with planting trees. And um, so it, and it's not just trees, it's trees and shrubs and grasses and so on. Um, but this is relatively easily done. But instead, we're sort of squabbling over CO2, not really treating it. I think it's dangerous to not make any move forward because we're crippled or paralyzed by the voices of a few people who say, wait a second, more science needs to be done. I'm the first to agree more science always needs to be done. We need to keep uh, doing you know, these studies of, of glacial ice and, and temperature records and so forth. But haven't we reached a point where we actually really need to do something? What my hope is with large-scale environmental restoration is that it can absorb the energy and the idealism and the compassion of the of the global climate change advocates mm -hmm. sort of draw them into something that actually solves problems 
that they can do without policy needing to be written or right. government support necessarily. Right. I'm inspired as usual from our discussion because you always bring up so many new points um, from your vast knowledge. I'm inspired that uh, maybe environmental restoration at a grassroots level could be the key and that mm -hmm. the citizens can just kind of bypass government and policy wonks and get right to the heart of the matter to make our communities better.